Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So uh, I was having lunch earlier today with Zach and Father Peter, and uh, I was showing off some of my knowledge of Augustine. I've been reading up on, uh, I guess, the founding charism of this university. When Father Peter mentioned his favorite quote to me, become what you are not yet. And I said, hey, you stole my line. <laughs> and he's like, oh no. Oh no, you take vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience in the Augustinian order. That's my line. <laughs> So uh, we will share that line tonight because I think it, it says a lot about what a university community is meant to be, qua community, and also what universities are meant to do for the individual students, staff, and faculty who are part of that. But before going into kind of the, uh, if, we, if you will, the butter chicken and masala potatoes of my talk tonight, I, I do want to, I, I am, I go to a lot of college campuses, probably 20, 25 a year. I've been to well over 100. And I have never been to a place that has cooked a meal based on the themes of my book. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. And the dining services staff not only made a great meal, but they read the book, because one of them, when I went to thank them in the kitchen, was like, good book, man, but chapter five, kind of boring. You should have dropped that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I am really happy about, about, how they all, about how they all engaged. So there is nothing like fall on a college campus, right? Um, it's just like there's like this, this sense of effervescence in the air, this sense of, of possibility. I love that, right? Um, uh, I shared earlier with the, the folks at lunch that there's this great line by Michelangelo, uh, the angel already exists in the stone and the artist just releases it. And you get that sense on a college campus, I think especially in the fall before the first midterms hit, et cetera, et cetera, right? And especially because there's this, this whole new group of folks um, who are doing what Marcel Proust uh, talked about. He said, you know, the true journey of discovery is not in seeing new landscapes, it's in developing new eyes. And that happened so much for me when I was 17 uh, at actually the place where Father Peter got his doctorate. I was an undergraduate at the University of Illinois back around the time that he was completing there. And Champaign-Urbana is not by a long shot the most cosmopolitan place on the planet. Uh, and yet, it just felt like the world was new to me. You know, there's this great line, uh, um, in a song called Broke Down Palace by the Grateful Dead, mama, mama, many worlds I've come since I first left home. And that's what it felt like to me, right? Just being in this place of endless possibility. That's the spirit that I wanna to talk to you in tonight. I wanna to ask the question, what does it mean to be a student at an Augustinian Catholic university in the city of Philadelphia, in this American moment? What does it mean to be a student at an Augustinian Catholic university in the city of Philadelphia at this American moment? So let's begin with the Augustinian part. I would be the first to confess I am a long shot from an expert. But in the reading that I've done in the past week in my preparation for coming to be with you today, I have a sense of why Augustine is one of the great classic authors of both the Western tradition and the Catholic tradition. His sense of searing self-reflection is powerful, right? I mean, there's the story in his confessions. He talks about this hanging out with his friends and just to make trouble, they hop a fence and they go steal a bunch of pears from a neighbor's pear tree. And it sounds so small. And yet, in this book that has become a classic of civilization, he can't stop thinking about it. And he's asking himself the question, you know, why, why did I do that? I love that sense of self-reflection. He's got this sense of like, I was meant for much more than this petty stupidity. I mean, I remember that so much in college, this sense of self-reflection. And you think back on your life with new eyes, you think to yourself, do I really want to be that person? Isn't there something else for me? 
Howard Thurman, um, speaking in an Augustinian vein, talks of his college experience this way. He says, my college, which was Morehouse, great African-American college down in Atlanta, he says, it held up a crown and it challenged us to rise up to achieve it. Become what you are not yet. So here's one of the memories that I thought about when I was in college about my earlier years in an Augustinian vein. I remember there was a fight in the cafeteria at school and me and everybody else in the cafeteria when we were in high school, we jumped up to watch this fight. Everybody but one person sat back down and there's my friend JJ, hasn't blinked an eye, he's just eating his apple. I'm like, JJ, there was a fight. What, why didn't you jump up to watch it? And JJ's like, I don't like fights. He looked at me, he's like, you don't like fights either. And he was absolutely right. Why did I jump up to watch that fight just because everybody else did? Why did Augustine hop the fence to steal those prayers? College is this beautiful time of self-reflection. Who am I? Who do I want to be? What does that crown look like? What is it going to take to rise to achieve it? Catholic. My life would not be the same had it, were it not for the Catholic influence. I talk about Catholicism with, some, with such love that it is uh, frequently people are like, but you're not Catholic, right? I'm like, you know, the subtitle of my book is about being a Muslim, <laughs> right? But it was Catholics who lit the path first for me. Dorothy Day. I love this artistic rendering of her out here in community, in protest, just being herself, right? Like for me, Dorothy Day was the first light shone on this path of, of how do you want to live your life? What does it mean to be in solidarity with the poor? What does it mean to have a deep connection to God and express that in the life that you live? And what does it mean to make a commitment over the long haul? Hall. Dorothy Day starts the Catholic Worker at 1933, in 1933, and she dies in that same place, having lived in solidarity with the poor for 47 years in 1980. I mean, that's commitment, right? I mean, you don't get that from flashes of anger. You get that from a deep connection to something true. For Dorothy Day, it was a Catholic understanding and definition of God. And I remember reading Dorothy Day, going to Catholic worker houses when I was 17, 18, 19 years old, seeing the sense of equanimity and commitment amongst Catholic workers and thinking to myself, I want some of that. My first steps down the path of connecting with the sacred, my first act of faith, if you will. Brother Wayne Teasdale, the most important mentor in my life. Brother Wayne would bring me to interfaith conferences that he spoke at at the Bartlett Jane Temple or some mosque somewhere, and he would have me sit in the front row, and then sometime during the question and answer session, he'd call me up and he would introduce me to this crowd of, you know, 500 people. And he would say, he's going to tell you about the interfaith youth movement. I was 21 at the time. And he would walk, you know, down the stage and I would say, whisper in his ear, Brother Wayne, there is no interfaith youth movement. <laughs> and he'd be like, well, you, you got to tell him something because I just introduced you. <laughs> so I'd literally get up on stage in front of 500 people at the Bartlett Jane Temple, and I would just riff. I would like dream out loud. I'd be like, you know, what if college campuses were places where young people from different religious backgrounds were doing service together? And people would be nodding. I'm like, well, I should probably keep going then, you know? <laughs> well, what if there were courses in interfaith studies and minors in interfaith studies? What if the CEOs of local hospitals and superintendents of local schools actually went to universities and said, because of our religiously diverse population, we're going to need professionals, teachers and social workers and business folks and doctors and nurses who are able to navigate religious diversity? And people would be nodding, and I'm like, I should probably keep going then. 
Right? And so literally, I told the story of what an interfaith youth movement would look like because Brother Wayne Teasdale invited me to, trusted me to. And I would come and sit back down, and he's like, that was pretty good. That was pretty good, you know. Brother Wayne would invite me to his uh, apartment in uh, Hyde Park, Catholic Theological Union, and we would meditate together for 15 or 20 minutes. I think I told the story in the book, and he would get mad at the clock ticking too loud, and he would get up and he would swear under his breath, even though he was a brother, and he would put it somewhere. Then we'd be done meditating, and I would see him retrieve it from the freezer. <laughs> we'd go for walks, and he would stop. And he would look at a dog and he'd be like, that is a very spiritual dog. <laughs> and then he would look at me and he'd be like, you are a very spiritual person. How am I going to say no to that, right? I mean, he had such good taste in dogs, <laughs> right? I'm in this country because of Notre Dame University. Because a Catholic university took a shot on a middling student, a wayward Muslim from India in 1975, that man would be my father. And when my dad was there, he barely passed his MBA courses, developed a fierce devotion to fighting Irish football and a deepened connection to the Catholic tradition. He would take us on the Skyway out of Chicago to Notre Dame football games on Saturday afternoons, and he would stop at the grotto, which is this shrine to the Virgin Mary on the Notre Dame campus. And uh, I would actually unbelievably see him do something that resembled Muslim prayer, which he never otherwise did, in front of this Catholic shrine. And one day, wanting to get to the football stadium a little bit more quickly, I said, Dad, you know, we Muslims, we don't pray before idols, right? And there's, there's the Virgin Mary there. You know, shouldn't we, shouldn't we get to the football stadium? He was, I was trying to use my little bit of Islamic knowledge as an excuse to like go get some popcorn early. And my dad looks at me, and again, this least of all, ri least ritualistic Muslim you will meet. He looks at me and he says, you know the Quran says about God? That he is light upon light. And he points in to the cove of the grotto, and there's hundreds of candles flickering. And he says, light upon light. And he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, you know, when it comes to anything, a person, a religion, you can always find differences. You can always find resonances. I would tell you, look for the resonances. It was a profound moment for me. I was nine or 10 years old. Um, Remember that, right? Always look for the resonances. I actually told that story in a room where the president of Notre Dame was, happened to be sitting, Father John Jenkins, and he invited me to uh, come tell that story to Father Hesburgh, the kind of, um, the, the person who, the, the Pope of Notre Dame University, can I say, <laughs> for a half century. You know, my mama didn't raise no fool. If you invite me to come speak with Father Hesburgh, I'm gonna go speak with Father Hesburgh, right? So I go down to South Bend, and I have this audience with Father Hesburg, and I happen to know at this point probably a half dozen Muslim faculty members at Notre Dame, right? It's interesting, Notre Dame has become more religiously diverse. And I asked Father Hesburg, you know, did people here in the Fighting Irish family, alum or the border, did they push back as you started to diversify the place and launch the Croc Center with the focus on global religion, et cetera? And he said, of course they did. And I said, what was your response? And he said, well, I told them to remember that in Greek, Catholic, small c Catholic, means universal. And the challenge for Notre Dame, the challenge for any Catholic university, the challenge, he said, for any Catholic is to connect its large c Catholic, its particular tradition, with the small c Catholic that is universal to make your particularity not parochial, but expansive. What does it mean to be a student at an Augustinian Catholic university? A university that invites you to self-reflection, invites you to a greater fullness, a tradition that 
has attempted to see its particularity not as parochial, but as expansive. Where a brother Wayne Teasdale, who took his own vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, would go to a Hindu ashram in India and take vows in a Hindu tradition, who would choose a young Muslim as his mentee. What does it mean to be a Catholic university that is constantly exploring its own theology of interfaith cooperation, connecting its large C Catholic, the particular, with small C Catholic, the universal. In Philadelphia, you know, the state of Pennsylvania, from the beginning, had one of the most progressive charters when it came to religious diversity. It spoke of people of any background being able to hold political office when the Jews of Pennsylvania decided it wasn't progressive enough in the late 18th century. The leadership of Pennsylvania adapted its Declaration of Rights to be even more expansive, late 18th century. When other states wanted to do declarations of rights, like North Carolina, they copied the first lines of Pennsylvania's Declaration of Rights. 1787, in Philadelphia, a group of our founding fathers meet in the Constitutional Convention. And as Bill Moyers likes to say, over the course of 87 days, they literally talk a nation into existence. It is remarkable to consider that. Don't ever think that a seminar room here is just talking. This is how things happen in the world. These people talked this country into existence, create the framework that becomes the Constitution. There's a great line by Walter Lippmann, the way the world is imagined will determine at any given instant what human beings are due. What you do here at a university talking to each other, discussing books. That's how big things happen. That's how imaginations expand. The first White House is not in Washington, D.C. It's here in Philadelphia. So when George Washington receives a message from Moses Sessius, the leader of the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, Sessius, who was worried about the fate of his people, the Jewish people, of which there are about 2,000 in the new United States. He asks George Washington, what will happen to us knowing how we have been hounded and hated and harassed in Europe? Washington writes back. The statement was either drafted or thought through at the White House here in Philadelphia. Washington writes back. The government of the United States will give to bigotry no sanction and to persecution no assistance, ends that letter, the letter to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island with this line, let the Lord of all mercies scatter light and not darkness. Make each of us useful in our own vocations and make us happy in his everlasting way. You will forgive me as a Muslim for reading some Islam into that line. We Muslims, the most common prayer, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the all-merciful, the ever-merciful. May the Lord of all mercies, God in the Quran, as I said earlier, is described as light upon light, scatter light and not darkness. It was here in Philadelphia that George Washington wrote or thought through that statement. When he went to visit with a group of Immigrant Irish, he said to them, the bosom of America is open to the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions, putting a stake in the ground for what this country is meant to be. We are all becoming what we are not yet. It's crazy coming off the highway here and seeing a an arrow pointing to Valley Forge, right? I mean, you live here, it's normal to you, but you know, to those of us from the prairie, <laughs> that's a pretty special site. It reminds me, do you know how deep 
anti-Catholicism goes in this country? Arthur Schlesinger, the great historian, once commented, anti-Catholicism is the deepest bias in the American people. You know how it expressed itself in the Continental Army sometimes? People would burn the Pope in effigy. And George Washington, not far from here, where the Revolutionary War takes place, writes to his officers in the Continental Army, and now I paraphrase, you idiots, do you not realize that we have Catholic troops from Maryland, that we are attempting an alliance with French Catholic Canada? Do you not know that this has to be an army for all religions, a nation for all people? That happens in this area. Ben Franklin, amongst the least religious of our founding fathers, is still committed to the flourishing of religious diversity. In Philadelphia, late 19th, uh, late 18th, early 19th century, he makes donations to the building funds of every religious community in Philadelphia at that time, including the Jewish community, on this condition, that when he dies, clergy people from all those communities would be part of the funeral together. I love that right? There's this sense of, I want all of you to flourish, but we have to flourish together. It's what Interfaith Youth Corps calls pluralism. Respect for different identities, cooperation between different communities, and a commitment to the common good. These people knew they were building a nation. I hinted a little earlier about anti-Catholicism in American history. Some of the ugliest scenes of anti-Catholicism happen here in Philadelphia. The Bible riots of 1844. 13 Catholics are killed because Catholics do not want a Protestant version and approach to the Bible used in public schools. A perfectly reasonable demand. This is what you inherit living in Philadelphia, this trauma of contradictions, this wondrous history of interfaith cooperation, Washington and Franklin, the Continental Congress, William Penn and the Declaration of Rights, but also this ugliness, also this violence, also this tension, also this prejudice. So what does all that mean in this American moment? My second book is a book called Sacred Ground. And part of what that book is about is looking into the history of anti-Catholicism in America. And I did a little cut and paste thing. I literally took what people said about Catholics 100 years ago, how Catholicism was not really a religion, but a political system bent on domination, how Catholic worship was really a seditious force in this country. And I thought to myself, hmm, who is this being said about now? Back when Catholic churches were literally barred, when you could not be a priest in Manhattan without risking arrest. Who is this said about now? It's funny right where Cordoba House was meant to be in New York City, in lower Manhattan, the first visible Muslim public project in this country it was meant to be a Muslim YMCA, a Villanova of sorts, inspired by the Muslim tradition, meant for the public service. And people said, this is a victory mosque at ground zero. This will be controlled by foreign elements. This is a Trojan horse for seditious Islam. Mike Bloomberg pointed out, you know, that's what they said about the Catholic Church that was meant to be built here in the late 18th century. You know that there was a riot outside the church when it was built 
a riot claiming that popery was going on on a day of religious observance, which happened to be Christmas Day, which is why people were in the church that day. You know that when Al Smith ran for president in 1928, the first Catholic on a major party ticket, served before that as the governor of New York, you know that they said about him that he built the Holland Tunnel to sneak the Pope into America for a takeover. <laughs> I thought about that actually in the fall of 2015 when I was on the South Lawn of the White House watching the Pope make an appearance with President Obama waving my little Vatican flag with 10,000 of my favorite countrymen, thinking to myself, this is literally what Norman Vincent Peale and the anti-Catholic forces said about Catholicism and the Pope 70 years ago. That if we allow Catholics in high office, and at that time there was a Catholic Secretary of State, a Catholic Vice President, a Catholic Speaker of the House of Representatives, not long before that there were six Catholics and three Jews in the Supreme Court. This was the fear coming into reality. I want to console you by saying the Pope did not attempt, at least to my naked eyes, a takeover of the United States. But it is interesting to consider what was said about people who pray with rosaries that is now said about people who pray with beads that look a lot like rosaries, does bees. So what does that mean for you? What does it mean to be a student at an Augustinian Catholic University in the city of Philadelphia in this moment of American history? when prejudice has reared, reared its ugly head again, when that prejudice feels a lot like the anti-Catholicism of the past, when conflict and tension is ripe in the air, what does it mean to sit in your chairs? Interesting little history lesson. After Al Smith lost that presidential campaign in 1928, largely as a result of anti-Catholic bigotry. A group of what I'd like to call interfaith leaders go into action. They build an organization called the NCCJ, the National Conference for, Catholic, for Christians and Jews. They decide that never again can the contributions of America's religious minorities be excluded from the public square because of bigotry. They begin to do bridge building work. They begin to launch a new narrative into the American imagination. That narrative is called America as a Judeo-Christian country. You all have heard that, right? It's kind of burned into our brains Kind of like you light fireworks on the 4th of July, you think of America as a Judeo-Christian country. We view it almost like God gave those words to Moses on Sinai or to Thomas Jefferson as he wrote the Declaration of Independence. The history actually is a little bit more complicated, but for me, even more inspiring than that. The notion of America being a Judeo-Christian country was not given to Moses on Sinai was not given to Jefferson during the Declaration of Independence. It was a civic invention of the 1930s. It was a group of interfaith leaders who decide that anti-Catholic and anti-Semitic pre prejudice was un-American. And they advance their ethos by helping to change the definition of America. A group of interfaith leaders helped create a framework that welcomed Catholics and Jews into this country's public square. We will pause for a moment to note the irony that now frequently when people invoke the term Judeo-Christian country, 
Often people whose ancestors were included in American civic life because somebody else invented that term, they invoke it as a tool of exclusion, not a tool of inclusion. We will simply note that irony and move on to points more inspiring. And ask the question, what does a new group of interfaith leaders do in this American moment? What does a group of students at say just considering an Augustinian Catholic University in the greater Philadelphia area do at a moment in the most religiously diverse nation in human history, the most religiously devout country in the Western hemisphere at a time of global religious tension and conflict when the ugly head of American religious prejudice is raised again? What is a new narrative that includes the three and a half million Muslims, the four million Buddhists, the growing numbers of Hindus and Jains and Baha'is and Sikhs and secular humanists in America. What is the next step after Judeo-Christian America look like? What do the bridge building activities that help to give actuality, concreteness to that new imaginative idea look like. Listen, I'm not smart enough to create that new narrative, but I'm smart enough to come to the places where I know the new narrators exist. I'm not smart enough to build those new bridges, but I'm smart enough to come to the places where the bridge builders exist. And to say to you that in the Augustinian tradition, in the Catholic tradition, in the Philly tradition, in the American tradition, there are forces of prejudice and there are forces of pluralism. There are people who over the course of time have advanced notions that these people don't belong or we can never cooperate. And there's people who have written the next chapter in American pluralism. What does it look like for you to be one of those authors? What does the next chapter in American religious pluralism look like? I wanna end with a final Philly story. Young seminary student comes from the deep south, Atlanta is a prince of the black church, comes to seminary not far from here. He hears that a great black intellectual is gonna give a talk on Christian love. It's the year 1950, it's the spring of that year. The man is the president of Howard University, Mordecai Johnson. Young Martin Luther King Jr. goes to hear him speak. Is astounded that the example that Mordecai Johnson presents in his sermon on Christian love is of a Hindu from India, Mahatma Gandhi. President Johnson says, it's the most Christ-like person who lived in the 20th century. I wouldn't have blamed young Martin Luther King Jr. from saying, you know what? I grew up in a black Baptist house, went to a black Baptist church, attended a black Baptist college. I'm on my way to the ministry. I don't have to hear this stuff about other religions. Instead, King does something else. He's intrigued. How is it that somebody whose principal text is not the Bible, but the Bhagavad Gita, how is it that he has a more fulsome definition and understanding and embodiment of nonviolence than any other Christian that at least Mordecai Johnson can think of? He's doubly intrigued that Mahatma Gandhi has appreciatively studied Hinduism, uh, uh, the Bible. He was a big fan of the Sermon on the Mount when he was a law student in India, read across Christian writers, in fact, loved Christian writers so much, he named his first ashram in South Africa, Tolstoy Farm. King goes back to Crozier Seminary. He's bought a half dozen books on Gandhi. I have this image of him in the library, a stack of books on Christian theology on his left, Niebuhr, Tillich, 
Rochenbush, a stack of books on Gandhi on his right, and he's reading across these traditions. He's trying to identify the shared values between Christianity and Hinduism. In the process, he's deepening into his Christian tradition. He is asking hard questions about himself. He's developing an appreciative knowledge of the Hindu tradition. I want to point something out. He's your age at the time. King enters Morehouse when he's 16. He graduates when he's 19 or 20. When he's at Crozier, he's 20 or 21 years old. That's about your age. His interfaith path begins at an institution of higher education. He hears something that sparks his imagination. How is it that a Hindu figure connecting principally with Hindu texts has come to this fulsome notion of nonviolence and turned it, of all things, into a social reform movement in India? A reform movement that my friend Zach knows well, starts in South Africa in the early 20th century. King is becoming an interfaith leader. And if you look closely at the civil rights movement, it is an interfaith movement. In Montgomery in 1955, when E.D. Nixon and Ralph Abernathy show up at King's door and ask him to lead the Montgomery Improvement Association, he thinks to himself, we are going to go Gandhi in this town. The Montgomery bus boycott is modeled entirely after Gandhi's Great Salt March in Gujarat from decades before. The great picture of King the man with the big bushy beard and Selma? That man is the rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Heschel says, after Selma, it felt like my legs were praying. King learns deeply from a Hindu, following his example in a social reform movement, amongst his closest friends in the civil rights movement are Jews. In the film Selma, you get to see some of this. You get to see the great Jesuit priest, Daniel Berrigan, preaching. What is the church? Is it the bricks and mortars from which we came? Or is it here in the streets of Selma? You get to see James Reeve, the Unitarian minister from Boston, come down to Selma saying, Martin Luther King Jr. issues the call, and so I came. He was one of four people who died there, a martyr. You see a post-Hajj Malcolm X going into a church and preaching reconciliation in Selma. Civil rights movement is an interfaith movement. King begins his journey as an interfaith leader in an institution of higher education not far from here when he's your age. You know, campuses are special places. There's no other place that I know of on the planet that brings this concentration of young people with big dreams from all kinds of different identities and says to them, we respect your diverse identities. We want you to build bridges between people from different backgrounds. We want you to make a commitment to the greater good, to this thing called Villanova, to this city called Philadelphia, to this nation, to this world, to the cosmos. And by the way, we want you to play a leadership role in that. We want you to take charge of your own education and leadership development. There's no other place in the world in which you can hear a lecture on interfaith cooperation in American history and then walk across the quad to Julie Sheets Willard's office and say, I want to be part of an interfaith group. No place in the world where you can say, hey, you know what, we're doing a big service day at the end of this week. I want to help turn that into an interfaith service day next year. No place in the world that, where ideas go to reality faster than a college campus. I'll tell you one of the most disconcerting times in my life, six, seven months after I graduated from college, I woke up one day. I was like, why do I feel so unbalanced, so discombobulated? I have a job that I like. I'm living in a great city. And I realized, oh, you know, Where's all the people telling me how great my idea is? <laughs> all these people, these faculty, these staff, 
That's what they do. Their job is to help you become what you are not yet. Their job is to help you reach that crown, right? To think, what is your place in the American promise today? How do you continue to carve out the path of pluralism when the ugly face of prejudice has shown itself? These are special places, these college campuses. I'll leave you with the line from Martin Luther King Jr. He says in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos, Chaos Our Community, Where Do We Go From Here is what it's called. He tells the story of an author uh, who died recently and his papers were found. And in these papers was the idea for this short story that the author never got to write. Short story is kind of a science fiction tale. What if everybody on the planet one day gets a letter and it says, you have inherited something magnificent, this great world house. I'm gonna call it planet Earth. And you can have it, but here's the deal. You gotta share it with seven billion other people got a large family, and, and this is the line that King writes on this, and all of us, he says, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Muslim and Hindu, black and white, Northerner and Southerner, think of the expansiveness of King's imagination in 1967. All of us, because we can never again live apart, must somehow learn to live with each other in peace. I love college campuses because they model world houses and they nurture a new generation of architects who go out and build them elsewhere. Thank you. The first question is, Certainly one who is part of an interfaith community needs to be accepting to other types of people. Outside, outside of more personal relationships, what are some other tremendous benefits that come with being a very accepting person? Right. I think that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure that I would use the word acceptance. Uh, uh, I think I would use the word cooperation. Uh, the reason for that is because as, as a Muslim, for example, I have deep appreciation and uh, deep appre appreciation for the Catholic tradition, but Muslim doctrine is different. And so just as I wouldn't expect Catholics to accept, so to speak, the entire dimension of Muslim doctrine, I wouldn't accept the entire dimension of Catholic doctrine, which doesn't mean I don't have appreciation for it. Right? And it doesn't mean that there, aren't, that there aren't manifest opportunities for cooperation, but I prefer the word, words appreciation and cooperation to acceptance. Uh, for many people, including myself, doctrine is, is important and, and adhering to having, having fidelity to, to that doctrine uh, uh, as it comes down in a tradition matters. Right? So I think one of the interesting, interesting challenges for people involved in, in interfaith cooperation and interfaith leadership is what does it mean to be deeply committed to one's own tradition with its various particularities? Think about what Father Hesburgh said to me, right? The large C in Catholic, there's a lot of particularity there. How does that connect to the small C in Catholic that is universal? So what, what are the benefits of this? I mean, man, I learn a ton from people of other religions, right? And, and religion is many things, but in part it's a window onto beauty. And so in kind of this constant learning about other religions, I, I'm constantly open to like new windows of beauty, right? New ways of understanding the world. And so just even, even reading Augustine this last week has been really moving to me. It's been profoundly moving to me. Uh, got another question right here. Uh, with tolerance sometimes coming at the cost of personal values, where do you draw the line of pluralism? Yeah, that's a great question. 
Um, so I think I think that uh, half of what I said earlier is relevant to this, right? That the um, in my mind, the key term is cooperate. The key terms are cooperation and appreciation uh, towards pluralism, not necessarily acceptance, right? So I think the the way that I think about this, we talked about this in the great student session earlier. If you have a religiously diverse democracy, you have a recipe for tension and conflict, right? Uh, um, diversity is not just the differences you like. It's not just samosas and egg rolls. Diversity is also the differences you don't like, right? Diversity is, is disagreements, like welcome to the world. I try to tell my kids this all the time. I'm, you know, I'm the curmudgeonly dad who like drives by the you know, the hippie with the, uh, with the uh, Celebrate Diversity bumper sticker, and I'm like, your bumper sticker is only half right, right? <laughs> diversity is not just the differences you like, so it's Celebrate Diversity, and then the second half of the bumper, you guys are like, oh, the guy, this guy was really nice up until this yelling at the hippies <laughs> with bumper stickers part. The second half of the bumper sticker is, you can't really fit this in a bumper sticker, but we'll try. How do you disagree with people on some fundamental things and work with them on other fundamental things? That's, that's how you negotiate diversity. How do you disagree with somebody on the nature of Jesus or a, a hot button political issue and still say, I'll serve on the PTA with you. I'll help you out in a hurricane. I will accept your help in a hurricane if we're surgeons together at a hospital, I'll perform surgery with you. The fact that we disagree on something else that's really important is not gonna cancel out our opportunity for relationships. So these are difficult things. I mean, our framework for this at IFYC is respect for identity, relationships between different communities, and a commitment to the common good. How do you negotiate those three things? And they are not easy. It is a constant negotiation, right? But fundamentally, we think the good society is defined by respect for diverse identities, relationships between different people, and a commitment to the common good. Which is to say, when America thrives, we all thrive, right? When the environment is clean, we all breathe better. When the economy is good, it's good for all of us, right? There are things that we hold in common that accrue to each of us individually and also to the, to the smaller communities in which, of which we are part. That was a geeky answer. It's geekier than you expected, wasn't it, Zach? <laughs> you were like trying to cut me off halfway through, I know. Oh, did you read my book really closely? Were you like, when, when my dad said, after I told him I was starting IFYC, when I was finishing my doctorate at Oxford, and when he was like, we immigrated from India for this? <laughs> Uh, I mean, you know, alhamdulillah, praise be to God, I think they're proud, you know? Every once in a while, like this is, is kind of funny, um, like I'll go speak at a business school and one of my parents will grumble, I'd rather you were, you know, you were in, you were in the business school than speaking at it as the interfaith guy. I'm like, I'm 41, I'm like 15 years into my career, can you not just be proud of me, you know? Uh, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think, but you know, honestly, this is, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a son. Like, there's a lot of other parts of my life. And my, so my parents, my parents, I think that they think this is great, and mostly they're like, how come we don't have more time with our grandkids? And why are you always late to stuff? And how come you don't invite us over for Thanksgiving dinner, and instead we invite you over, right? So, as, and that's as it should be. That's a full life. Like, a full life is not, is, is when you talk about things other than your work with, with people. Okay, we had one more question. Um, you discuss interfaith relationships multiple times in your book. After reading your, your own experiences, I would love to hear your opinion on how to best make an interfaith relationship work. In particular, how can you raise a family when you have different values? Is it possible? Yeah, that's a great question. So, hey, so this happened in Philadelphia like four or five years ago. So I'm signing, I'm signing books and somebody comes up to me and uh, she's like, I just, I just have to know did you marry Sarah? I'm like, you need to read past chapter four. <laughs> <laughs> and you made my wife really mad, you know? 
my wife's like, I'm gonna write a book with all my ex-boyfriends. You know, <laughs> they were different religions too, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, my, my wife and I are from different Muslim traditions, right? She's a Sunni Muslim, I'm an Ismaili Muslim. And Ismailis, th there's clearly a lot of overlap. Ismailis are kind of like the Catholics of Islam. So we have a Pope figure, we have a, a, a line of Imams, which are similar in some ways to the line of popes or even the line of saints. So there are differences and, and, and there are, and that's within the tradition of Islam, right? So obviously we share a holy book, we share uh, um, the prophetic figure of, of the prophet Muhammad, we share the major religious holidays, and there's this, this set of additional things that come along with, with the particular interpretation of Islam that I have as an Ismaili. And, and uh, we, because I do this for a living, right, there's like, a million things I get wrong, this I kind of saw around the curve a little bit, and I'm like, look, here's how we do this reasonably well, right? Here's how we, here's how we take a challenging situation, what's going to be a naturally challenging situation, and manage, manage the natural tension. You're never gonna resolve all the tensions, right? What you try to do is manage natural tensions and magnify points of commonality and cooperation. Uh, so it's, it's a negotiation in our, in our own lives. So our way of doing this is basically we are part of a broader Muslim community and we have an Ismaili tutor, which is to say we are not part of an Ismaili community. You can't be part of a dozen communities. It's a very hard thing to do, right? There just isn't enough time, especially when you're committed to watching Fighting Irish games on Saturday afternoons and religious education class interferes with that. Or... Maybe some people would say it's the other way around, right? But that's how we've done it. I would say, if you are in such a relationship, and these are beautiful things, right? Like, like any committed relationships are beautiful, beautiful things. What did Blake say? Um, we are put on earth a little space that we may, bear, may, we may learn to bear the beams of love. That's one of my favorite quotes, right? Like, that's a gift, that's a gift from God, that relationship, and, how are you going to manage the natural tensions that will emerge with different rituals, different holidays, different practices, different communities, et cetera? My guess is the values part is the easiest part because while religions are nowhere near the same, as I said, doctrine, ritual, practices, communities, these things differ, there are a whole set of values that are in common. Now the stories are different, but you will not find a religion that does not care about hospitality or compassion or service or welcoming the stranger or some notion of grace, right? These things are deep commonalities across traditions. It's the kind of thing that uh, you lift up the value of, common, of compassion and you ask the question, how do our different traditions approach that? That doesn't answer the question Right? Do you get? Do you go to CCD? That's that's a tough practical question. But in a Catholic Jewish marriage, you can talk about the centrality of mercy, talk about the centrality of compa of, of compassion, etc. Um, there's much better books on this. There's a great book called Being Both. But there, there's at this point there is a literature on how you have uh, um, how you navigate the natural tensions of a religious a, a relationship with people from different religious backgrounds or interpretations. Having said that, I, let me just say two more things. Number one, any Catholic Catholic marriage, when the people are being really honest, they'll be like, we have an interfaith marriage. <laughs> because her idea of Catholicism and my idea of Catholicism, I don't know what, I don't know what you know. <laughs> so you gave me a look there. I saw that look. <laughs> this is all to say that, that there are, there are Muslims and Jews with more similar ideas about their traditions in some cases than there might be Catholics and Catholics, right? The way people orient around religion is a key question. I do not mean by any means to say that these, these differences get reduced, but people orient around religions in different ways. Right? You can orient around Catholicism differently, and you can orient around Islam and Judaism in a similar way. We do have time for more questions from the audience. So we have one right here. How can I get involved with the Interfaith Youth Corps? That is a, are you a plant? 
I don't mean like a fern. I mean like, to, okay. Uh, so, so uh, I, a couple ways. Number one, the most important way is right here, right? With, with uh, my friend Julie Sheets Willard. Give a hand. She's awesome. Right. Right. In, all, in all seriousness, a national treasure in, in interfaith cooperation, worked with one of the great scholars in this movement for years and years and years, Len Swidler. You guys stole her away from Temple University. Uh, so Julie, she's the staff person responsible for interfaith programs at Villanova, right? So Julie and her interfaith council are kind of your first stop. I understand that there's gonna be a meal with plenty of gooey desserts in the next week or two, right? Um, IFYC hopes to be a resource in a variety of ways to campuses and to students. So if you're super geeky about this, I hope you're at least a little geeky about this, go to our website, ifyc.org. We've got videos, you know, somehow, I, um, you know, I don't know how this happens, but I've written books in addition to Acts of Faith, so there's a couple of other books on the website. There's all kinds of articles that we've done. You can access those directly. You can also be involved with IFYC through through Julie and Villanova, right? Uh, we've met uh, faculty members, Carrie's back there, who are teaching interfaith courses, and it seems to me might be interested in teaching more. Uh, the dean of the business school, is she here? She Joyce? Uh, dean of the business school was at a meeting earlier. That's rare, right? It is rare that the dean of the business school at a university is, is says, I really wanna be involved in interfaith cooperation. My sense is that, is that Villanova is, you know, I think it's, it's in the strategic plan under Father, Father Peter. He, he said, first we're gonna win a national championship, then we're gonna become a model of interfaith cooperation, <laughs> right? So you've got those reverse, right? The national championship came early, right? Um, this is a great place to be interested in interfaith work, both intellectually through courses and intellectually and practically through actual programs. I would take advantage of that in every way, shape, or, shape, or form, right? Um, and just keep your eye out for various religious diversity things happening in the world. So, you know, it's interesting to think that in Houston, we Americans expect faith communities to step up and play a central role in relief efforts. Houston is maybe the most religiously diverse city in the United States got hit by a massive hurricane. My bet is there is more interfaith cooperation happening in Houston in the last two weeks than has happened there in the history of that city. So just imagine, what if you lived in Houston? You graduated from Villanova and you get a great job in Houston and you're active in a Catholic church there and there's a mosque down the street and the mosque says, hey look, our sanctuary is, is, uh, is fine but our kitchen got overrun with water. We will open a shelter in our sanctuary for people, but we're gonna need a place where food can be prepared so they're fed. And you're at the local church down the street. Do you say, ah, we, you, know, we, you Muslims, you don't believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, we don't, we're not gonna do this with you? Or do you say, man, how awesome is this, right? Our kitchen's okay, right? Our, we don't have place to put people, in the kind of way you do, in a shelter type way, but we would love to be the preparers of food and cooperate with you. And you look at that and you think to yourself, wait a second, does this relationship have to end after the disaster's over? After the relief efforts are done? Couldn't this be the beginning of more cooperation between us? You see what I'm saying? And, and those examples abound if you just have the eyes for them. Right? If, you, if you just start paying attention to religious diversity in the world, pay attention to the various ways that it produces prejudice and conflict, and the various ways it produces really inspiring cooperation. It was a complicated answer. You were like, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience? Do you have any advice um, for the Democrats and Republicans in the country in terms of <laughs> pol political, um, 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 I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd be reading my George Washington right now, you know, I'd be reading my James Madison. And part of what I mean to say is, uh, um, I just think, 
I just think it's fundamentally un-American to exhibit religious prejudice, right? And I think the ugliest moments in our history are moments of religious, I mean, it is, it's the moments of, in the 1850s, the Know Nothing Party, which was a party with a single plank in its platform, which is no Catholics in America. It was an anti-Catholic. They elected 75 people to the US Congress. Abraham Lincoln had to stand up against them. What an embarrassment, right? What, what an embarrassment that in 1844, and the people were killed in Philadelphia for being Catholic. And how inspiring that General Washington writes to his officers, you fools, really? We're trying to be one army and build one nation? Something that's never been done as far as a religiously diverse democracy, and you're gonna allow anti-Catholic expressions in your army? So my, my advice is I just think that there are certain bedrock things that are definitional to this country. And I just think respecting religious identity Nurturing relationships between different people and committing to the common good that is America is a is foundational, right? Um, and disagree in economic policy, right? Di disagree in a, a range of things. Don't don't relive the darkest chapters of American prejudice today. Um, we have another question from the audience. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you had talked a little bit about uh, access to information. And when people are searching for something, they go to the internet and they search. And the most divisive things come up because they're published most frequently. So have you taken a look at how do you get more access to people if they're searching on the internet and it has to do with faith to get the positive stories out instead of seeing the neg negative ones all the yeah. time? So I, I, that's a great question. Um, you know, so there is a part of this that's just like, how do you manipulate the algorithms? First of all, the internet is a cesspool on Mars. I mean, honestly, I'm like, really? You, you're that mean, right? You don't wanna be that guy. Have you read August, Augustine? Seriously, Mr. Internet people, right? Become what you are not yet, right? You need to give your lecture to them. <laughs> I think part of this is about manipulating algorithms. But I think more of it is about new storytellers, right? I think, you know, ultimately, the, ultimately online, it's just gonna be ugly stuff that comes to the top, right? It's just, th those, those, those people are gonna win online. They're, they're committed to, I mean, if you look at the comments on any, on, you know, I used to write a, a, an online column for the Washington Post, like 95% of the comments were, were terrible, right? And you just have, to, you just have to, to trust that that doesn't, they were ugly, they were prejudicial, Muslim this, Muslim that, right? You just have to trust that that doesn't represent the broad swath of Americans or humanity. I think what I put my trust in is, is not so much algorithms, but new storytellers, right? Like, so if you walk out of here thinking to yourself, who knew that Philadelphia had this, remarkable history and in interfaith cooperation and this ugliness of anti-Catholic riots. What does the next chapter look like? And now that I'm here, what does it mean that I get a chance to, to be part of writing that next chapter, right? So I would rather speak with 500 potential new storytellers than like play for 5 million random hits online. I really would, right? Like at the end of the day, I believe in 19-year-olds making decisions about their vocation long-term and thinking to themselves, I'm gonna be an interfaith leader. This is who I'm gonna be for the rest of my life. I'm, gonna, my, I'm going to practice this uh, in my career as a nurse. I'm gonna do this in my marriage. I'm gonna, this is how I'm gonna be a neighbor. I'm gonna make sure that in the places that I touch, we're, we are, we're nurturing a healthy, religiously diverse community. Let's, let's leave with a student question. Seriously. Yes. Thank you again for coming tonight. Um, right, tell me your name. Uh, Marcus Rose. Great. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, 
for most of us college students um, in all of our classes, we are receiving so many amazing advice from our teachers, our professors, and from speakers such as yourself of important values that we should take and important lessons that we should take af um, after the class and after the lecture. How can we take in all of the ones that we want to while still finding out the ones that we want to keep as a part of ourselves? Yeah, man, what a great question. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I think that that's part of the Augustinian part of this, right? Like, I was really struck by by the confessions and just, again, how, how deeply self-reflective Augustine was. And it's not like nobody had told him before about the Catholic tradition, right? But something at some point clicks for him. And, like, he's like, I need to follow this. I think that that... I think that that happens for, for people at different times, right? Um, so, I mean, I tell the story in Acts of Faith about, it's not like I'd never met my grandmother before, right? Uh, just, it's just that for the longest time, she was the person telling me to marry a Muslim girl and to not ride my skateboard too much because I was clumsy, right? About which she is right. <laughs> and then, all of a sudden, I am ready to like, hear her talk about Islam as a tradition of mercy. And I have, I've got the ears to hear those stories and I've got the eyes to see her embodying that. And my life has changed. And it's just, you know, my dad would be like, I told you about her, her work a thousand times, right? So I, I, again, this is also like the beauty of college. It's that it's, it's the reason that people love their alma mater, the reason that there's like, a bunch of folks in this room who I imagine went to Villanova and like to come back for events like this is because some random thing happens in college that you never expected and it changes your life and you never know what that is. But that's part of the beauty of being between 17 and 21 and part of the beauty of being in an environment where, where wonderful randomness is happening all the time. But there's a, the, the uh, um, uh, first song on the U2 album, the last U2 album, The Miracle of Joy and Ramon, you know this song? You don't know this song. <laughs> Are you killing me? Uh, I think it goes, I woke up at the moment when the miracle occurred, right? And, and what I realized, I mean, seeing, you listening to that hundreds and hundreds of times, I'm like, the miracles are occurring all the time, like all the time. It's not a question of how many miracles there are, it's a question of how awake I am, right? And so, Part of the value proposition of Villanova is if you come here and spend four years and pay a reasonable amount of attention, something here will change your life. That's it. That, that's a four-year residential education at a, at a, at a, a, a knowledge-rich place like Villanova. We're going to have 10,000 really smart people in a beautiful space zinging into each other all the time. We're going to have adults who found their passion, spend time with young people who are finding their passion. If you come here for four years and pay a reasonable amount of attention, something here will change your life. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs>